So I'm doing a quick little Q&A now on violin making, a little bit on guitar making. Um, how does one get into this line of work slash hobby? So my journey was an atypical one. I went to culinary school, got sick of the toxic masculinity in that atmosphere, so I took a cabinet making course in college just to sort of, I guess, taste a different flavor of toxic masculinity and get out of there for, you know, at least a few hours one day a week. Uh, learn my way around tools and lumber that way. Started building solid body electric guitars, because a, a solid body guitar body is essentially just a funny shaped cabinet door. And then I built a couple of small body acoustics after that, because I just wanted to try something new. And I didn't have, and I still don't have, a wide enough planar thicknesser for a full size acoustic guitar. So I did that for a little while. Uh, I tried to build a violin just because I was curious and wanted to try something new and more challenging. Because uh, I'm a very detail oriented person. And I'm very prone to hyperfixating, so I thought that would be sort of a good outlet for that. And I, I've enjoyed it very much. I've carried on with that. Uh, in, in light of Ashley's transplant, I was able to get out of commercial kitchens, start doing this full-time, because I needed to be there so I could, um, A, go visit her in the hospital while she was recovering, and B, be present for her during the rest of her recovery at home. And I couldn't do that if I was doing, you know, 12-hour shifts in a commercial kitchen. So that was nice. Did that. It's been working out for me so far. Not the best. Not rich. It works. Where do you source your wood slash materials from? So prior to the pandemic, um, I very much liked to shop for wood hands-on so I could figure out sort of density, grain orientation, make sure there are no knots or hidden wormholes or anything. So I would go to uh, A&M Wood in Cambridge or Exotic Woods Inc. in Burlington, manhandle the wood, pick it from there. But um, Old, World <laughs> Old World Tone Woods is an online website that supplies basically... Um, very good quality maple, very good quality spruce, very adequate quality uh, ebony for fingerboards and fittings. And I've been doing that a lot since the pandemic started. But realistically, as long as you know what you're looking for and you've been able to sort of figure out what you're looking for to satisfy not only needs of the instrument, but also you as a maker, you can pretty much grab wood from anywhere. I've grabbed wood from Turf for Lumber before. Uh, I've grabbed uh, spruce tops from Home Depot of all places before. So it's pretty much, as long as you can get your hands on some lumber, you can make a violin that'll make music. It might not be perfect, it might not be the best, it might not win you any competitions, but it'll be decent. Do you have to have a solid background in music in order to create quality workmanship? Not at all, no. Uh, I'm musically literate, I don't play any instruments. I've got a good ear, which is, I think, um, a very important part of violin making, at least in terms of making quality instruments, because you have to be able to tell when you need to make adjustments, when the wood you've made is a good choice or a bad choice, um, you know, that sort of thing. But you don't really need to understand music. You need to sort of have a good ear for tone and timbre and that sort of thing and be able to at least match what you're looking for. So music, optional, ears, necessary. <laughs> what is the difference between gut strings and metal strings? So with violin strings, essentially you've got a core, which is made of one material, and then windings wrapped around it, which is made of another material. Uh, steel strings have a stainless steel core, usually wound in either steel or nickel, and they're tremendously tolerant to uh, terrible humidity changes and temperature changes. And also, because the core is steel, it doesn't really stretch, so it's got very good tuning stability. But because the core is steel, it's not terribly flexible, so you don't end up with a great deal of sort of complexity of tone in general. Um, Complexity of tone is basically a result of the core of the string vibrating at certain frequencies and um, certain amplitudes, which allows you to sort of add more color and depth and complexity to your tone. You don't really get that with stainless steel strings or uh, steel core strings. You do get that to some extent with uh, synthetic core strings, which still have the steel winding. The core is uh, something called perlon or teklon or any of those things. It's essentially nylon. It's literally nylon with certain, certain um, impurities deliberately introduced which has good elasticity, so you can still get complexity of tone and warmth and nuance, but it's more tuning-stable than gut. Uh, it's a lot more resistant to humidity and temperature changes than gut, and also a lot more affordable than gut. Incidentally, cat gut strings, not made from cats, never have been. Usually a sheep or goat, um, although traditionally, back in you know the very early days before the violin was an instrument, uh, Middle Ages, anywhere from about the 12th century to about the 15th century, it was made from cattle gut. It's sinew from the intestine of the animal that's been boiled and treated, usually in lye. So that's fun. What is the difference between the different types of metal strings? So, I'm going to include synthetic strings in this because they've got metal windings, which is often uh, 
led to them being mistaken for metal strings in spite of the fact that they're technically synthetic. So the core of the string is what is essentially responsible for the overall character of the string, and therefore the character of sound that your infant produces with the strings on it. The winding of the string contributes somewhat to character, but for the most part it affects the way the rosin on your bow hair interacts with the string, and also the feel under the fingers. Uh, with nylon, it's a pretty good sort of base level synthetic string. It's not terrible. You've got you know, reasonable complexity of tone. It's not overly strident like steel core strings tend to be. And it's not overpowering uh, in terms of uh, actual volume of sound like steel core strings tend to be. Perlon is essentially nylon with additive carbon powder, which just slightly increases the elasticity of the string, which is a detriment to tuning stability. But it uh, contributes in a positive way to the overall sort of warmth and complexity and nuance of tone, because you get the fundamental frequency of whatever you're playing. So if you're playing, say, an open A string, it'll still be an A, but you get harmonics above that and below that. Uh, the octave points will be an A an octave below what you're playing, and an A an octave above what you're playing, and a, an octave above and below that, and on and on, at sort of gradually diminishing volumes. And, yeah, I think that's what's most important to sort of grasp when it comes to strings, is that the core is, is the heart of the string. The winding essentially affects how um, it interacts with your bow hair. Uh, there are a few typical winding materials. You've got steel, you've got nickel... Uh, silver, gold, and platinum. Platinum, I would say, interacts the best with bow hairs just because it's sort of soft and supple and malleable. So you get sort of a lot more gut-like warmth and sort of integrity of tone. Like, it's it's very lifted up from the bottom, um, which is nice. Uh, but platinum is terribly, terribly expensive. So I'd say just below that is silver. I like gold. Gold's very bright sounding, very clean sounding, so I like that very much for uh, E-strings. But, um, yeah, if you can't afford platinum strings, which most people can't, they're like 300 bucks a set, that's ridiculous. <laughs> or do they go for silver and nickel over a stainless steel winding? What different types of bridges are there, and how do they contribute to the sound? So, the bridge is the uh, apparatus by which the vibration of the strings is transmitted to the body of the instrument, which in turn moves the air inside of it, which is what produces sound. There are two styles of bridge that you'll encounter with some frequency. This one is the most common by far. This is a modern bridge or a, a traditional bridge. These came out around the 1880s, and it's basically what you'll find in every violin from now. Or every violin. <laughs> You've also got this, which is a Romantic era bridge, often called the Baroque bridge. I don't know why. These weren't introduced until well into the Romantic era. But because of the curvature of the bridge at the top, you actually end up with the uh, tension of the strings acting at almost the diagonal. So you'll have your G-string here, which is putting a force on the curve perpendicular, which will transmit to this foot, not this one. Same with the D-string, towards just the inner edge of this foot. The A-string will be the inner edge of this foot, and then the E-string will be the far edge of this foot. Same here. Uh, so the thickness of the bridge will greatly impact the weight of the bridge, which transmits, or uh, which impacts how much of the vibration is lost in the bridge before being transmitted to the body. Thinner bridges are very, very good in terms of transmitting the most vibration, therefore the most complexity of tone and the most volume of tone. However, once you get too thin, you run into a great risk of warpage, breaking, snapping. So it's, it's sort of a, a, a bit of a, a balancing point or a knife edge where you have to sort of figure out how thin you can go before you lose too much. Um, I like my top edges on finished bridges to be about 1.5 millimeters, and the bottom of my feet to be about 2.8 millimeters although every maker has sort of a different opinion and take on that. Um, when it comes to the actual styles of bridge, they're not terribly different. The curvature is pretty similar. It just comes down to the little heart shape. So you've got your uh, heart here, sometimes called kidney. You've got a, a very sort of uh, obvious or pronounced heart here. Uh, it just depends sort of where the weight is relieved from the bridge, which will affect sort of how much of the vibration is lost. Um, because this one's so close to the bottom of the bridge, you end up losing a little bit more vibration, which is good for violins that would otherwise be overly strident, but it can be bad for violins, which would be sort of uh, deep and low and mellow and um, not very um, sort of pronounced in terms of the projection or overall volume of the instrument. Uh, I would say go for these in general is what you'll find on most violins to begin with, but every once in a while if you have a violin that's too bright, too strident, or too strong sounding, Pop a broker romantic area bridge on it. See if that helps. Here are a few questions on bows. Uh, do you learn to make bows along with violins, or is that something else entirely? 
So a bow maker is called an archetier, a violin maker is called a luthier, which is unfortunately also spilled over into the guitar making world. Um, there's a lot of overlap in terms of applicable skills, but it doesn't necessarily mandate that one is both. Um, I would say I'm, a, I'm an above average luthier and a below average archetier. That said, most luthiers will at the very least know how to rehair a bow and usually replace a frog and do the regular dressing on bow. So they're technically different jobs with different skill sets, but there's enough overlap that a lot of people just do both and do a perfectly fine job of both. Uh, how does a bow affect sound? Can you use just any bow with a violin? This one's tricky because yes, theoretically you could. In practice, once you factor in the human element, no, absolutely not. So if you could hook up a highly sensitive sensor to violin strings and wield a bow in a robot hand, which is able to exert exactly the same amount of pressure on the strings, the same speed, and the same amount of actual bow force across a numerous um, you know, quantity of bows, it wouldn't matter. In practice, because we're humans with different anatomies and different needs as players, it matters a lot. Uh, so the bow is basically a lot more important for the player than it is for the violin it's being played on. Um, this one here has a mammoth ivory and gold tip which means it's a little more forward heavy than a lot of bows are, but the player this is meant for has very tiny hands and very loose wrists. So that little bit of extra weight on the front end just lets her sort of dig into the strings and produce fuller, more complex nuance tones without having to actually manually rotate her wrists and dig in, which can cause wrist strains and unpleasantness. Uh, so it's a lot more important to find a bow, but also a violin that works for you as a player, than it is to necessarily match your bow to your violin, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, because if you're wielding a bow that's too heavy, or the camber's too shallow, or it's just not right for you, you won't be able to make good sounds on your violin with it. Um, if the bow is right for you, you can make any violin sound better than it would with uh, an inferior or a mismatched bow. Similarly, um, all of that, you know, theoretical robot arm stuff is contingent on the hair being the same across the bows. There are several grades of horse hair from several different species of horses in several different climates. Um, what that does essentially is it affects the coarseness of the hair and also the coarseness of the actual keratin scales on the outside of the hair. There's also synthetic horse hair, which I'm not fond of. Um, so with actual horse hair, as I said, you've got the keratin scales, which are basically entire scales of keratin stacked on top of each other which means that it's very good at holding rosin, maintaining its hold on rosin, and therefore improving the uh, ability of the bow to vibrate the strings to produce sound. Synthetic horsehair is essentially conecolon, which is like a little string of plastic, which has been either chemically or physically abraded, so it's got some coarseness, so it'll hold on to rosin for a while, but as you play, that coarseness wears away, and you end up with a very smooth shaft of hair, which will not hold rosin very well, will require more frequent rosining, and will generally produce scratchy and more unpleasant tones. Um, that said, straight from either the factory or the luthier or a chetier, the hairs will sound pretty similar. Once you're playing for, you know, two or three weeks a month, depending on how much you practice, it'll change a lot. Uh, I will say synthetic bow hair is a lot more resilient to changes in humidity. It doesn't really stretch or contract very much, which is handy if you're, say, busking outside or frequently performing outside but not necessarily beneficial to every player. Uh, it's also a little more resistant to breaking. So while in theory you won't lose as much fullness of your bow hair, um, in practice it'll smooth out pretty quickly, so you'll need to rehair almost as quickly as you would with natural fiber. Hope that helps. What is the difference between a one-piece back and a two-piece back? One is made of one piece of maple, the other is made of two. Thank you. No. Um, with a two-piece back, ideally it's book-matched. So you've got a single wedge of a maple tree, you've sawn that in half down the middle, and you've taken the outer edge and joined it to itself. So you've got a basically mirror image of the same slice of wood. Because of that, you've got nearly identically mirrored uh, density of maple, which means you've got a fairly nearly identical uh, ability to produce sound and vibrate across sides. So this point here will be the same density as this point here, which is very good in terms of maintaining sort of... Um, balance or equality across all four strings. So I'm not going to do the, D, the G string for this, just because G strings tend to be a little warmer sounding, which sort of throws off the way microphones interact with them. But if I do the D string and the E string, it should be the same volume 
different pitches, same volume. See, similar. Uh, with a one piece back, you've got a single piece that runs the entire width of the instrument. Because of that, you've got significant variation in density of wood across the width, which can be used for good effect. Um, in the case of violins, which tend to be overly strident, especially violins strung with strings, which tend to be overly strident on the E string, you can put less dense maple over here on the bass side, because remember, the bridge acts in sort of an X shape in terms of the transmission of vibrations to the instrument itself. If you put less dense wood over here on the bass side, it'll help sort of, um, to some extent, diminish the overall volume of the E string, which will diminish the volume and sort of shrillness and unpleasantness of that. Uh, however, if you don't know what you're doing, and you put your one piece back in the opposite direction, so your less dense wood is over here on the treble side, and your more dense is over here on the high side, you'll end up with a dead-sounding G string and a very, very screechingly bright E string. So in the hands of a competent luthier, you can get, you know, one piece bags that sound phenomenal. In the hands of someone you don't know or who doesn't know what they're doing, you can get one piece bags that sounds terrible. It's also sort of interesting for me why there's this weird sort of prejudice towards one piece bags in favor of them amongst sort of classically trained violinists, because there were a lot of very good quality French and German-made instruments from the late 1700s through the middle of the 1800s that are one-piece backs that sound phenomenal. And then there were some from similar regions in lesser workshops that had two-piece backs that sounded terrible. And there was this sort of thinking back, sort of the post-World War II era, uh, during the Cold War, where people were like, well, clearly it's better because of the one-piece. It's not. It's better because it's from a better workshop and a better workman. That's about it. But yeah, used properly one-piece back can sound phenomenal. Um, I think two-piece backs are generally the way to go if you're just shopping for an instrument from someone you don't know or a maker you're not familiar with. Yeah. So before I address these next few questions, I want to at least sort of give a supernary glance at the mechanism of action of a violin and how it produces sound. So you've got your bow, which has horse hair, which has been dragged through rosin, which will grab and release the violin string as you play anywhere from 250 to 6,000 times per second, depending on how fast you're dragging the bow, and also the coarseness of the hair and the potential for adhesion of the rosin you're using. What this does is sends the violin into a vi the violin string into a vibration like this, where from the side it's an ellipsis with one fixed point being the top of the bridge, and the other being either your finger, in the case of a fingered note, or the nut, in the case of an open string. This is putting down force with every single vibration on the bridge, which transmits its vibrations to the top of the violin. Now, the important part of, of this is that that's essentially what is setting the air inside the violin into motion, which is what's producing audible sound. And when it comes to the sound post, that's your sound post, tailpiece, fingerboard, strings, bridge. What the sound post does is it acts like a fulcrum. So instead of the top plate just bouncing up and down with each vibration, like it would on an acoustic guitar or a violin that for some reason did not have a sound post, it acts as a fulcrum. So instead of just the up and down vibration of the entire top plate while the back and ribs remain stationary, you've got suddenly a sine wave where the fulcrum point is the top of the sound post, or a cosine wave where the fulcrum point is the top of the sound post with every single vibration. Now, at a supernary glance, this looks like it would reduce the amplitude of vibration. Actually, it increases it. And if you have a trampoline, or literally any sort of stretched surface, and you put a fulcrum under it, and then drop a quarter on it, you'll see it bounces higher with a fulcrum in place. But additionally, what this does is it acts as a connection point between the top plate and the back plate. So instead of the back plate remaining stationary and just acting like a mirror for whatever the air is doing inside of it, it is now vibrating in sympathy with the top plate, also in a sine or cosine wave which increases the overall volume of the instrument and also the uh, complexity and nuance of tone because now it'll respond more... Uh, it'll basically double whatever you're doing. So if you're playing, you know, an arpeggio or staccato, rather than being sort of very subtle, almost inaudible sort of thing, it'll suddenly be amplified twofold by the fact that both plates are vibrating. Additionally, the sound post acts as sort of um, almost a support for the... Uh, just the force of the strings pushing down on the top of the violin. Um, strings at tension enact anywhere between 250 and 400 foot-pounds of force on the top of a violin. Uh, now, it's spruce. So spruce is a very good longitudinal strength. So top to bottom, it's a very, very strong wood. Side to side, it'll crack like nothing. So without a sound post in place, you'll end up with a bridge popping through the top relatively quickly, unless your top is sort of egregiously thick, 
I like like a two or three millimeter thick top. Some of the old German fiddles have like five millimeter thick tops, so you could technically pop out the sound post and have like a little quiet practice violin for you or something, but I don't like it. So that enacts a little bit of um, support to stop the top from caving in and collapsing. And on the opposite side of the violin top or belly, your sound post will go right here. And then on the other side, you've got a bass bar, which provides not only more support to prevent the arch from collapsing, because the tops are carved and curved, but also it uh, very slightly dampens the A and E strings, which is very important because there's so much more tension in a higher frequency string that without it, you'll have you know your A and E string, especially your E string, just screaming at you, while the G and D string are sort of very, barely audible whispers. Um, so yeah, you need the bass bar basically to help balance tone overall, but also provide some longitudinal and latitudinal strength to the top. And the sound post does the same thing, and also increases the overall amplitude of vibration, which is fun and exciting. Um, what are the F-holes for? Similarly, you could theoretically just punch a little circular hole in it, like an acoustic guitar, and still have sound come out. You would hear it. But rather than just acting like a speaker with a single vibrating plane, the violin top has actually been very, very ingeniously designed back in the uh, 1600s with little F-hole shapes. In fact, the F-hole slightly predates the violin by about 35 years, but that's not terribly important for this argument in particular. So rather than just acting as a single speaker, you've now got a violin top which acts like an entire sound system. So your middle frequencies, anything in sort of the D to about the B above your A string range, is going to vibrate the top plate most willingly because it's just going to be a, a sympathetic vibration. So you've got basically a little speaker here. At the bottom, you've got what is essentially a big old subwoofer, which is very good for your low notes, your open G string, pretty much anything up to third position on the G string, and up to even second position on the D string will um, significantly impact the vibration of the lower bow. Why the F-hole shape? See these little wings right here? Little tiny wings. Those act like tweeters. Those are very good for very, very high notes, and they're very important in terms of being able to sort of allow the top to vibrate in sympathy with the strings and notes that are above, I'd say, second position on the E string, although third or even fourth position on the A string will also sort of send them vibrating. But the shape of the F-holes is important. There are variations in shape. These are Strad-style F-holes. These are also Strad-style F-holes. But you'll notice that the overall shape with the two little wings on the F-hole is consistent across all makers. Even, you know, uh, Amadi at the very start had sort of unusually long kind of angled wings on his um, F-holes. But, you know, the overall shape is similar, although the character of the shape will vary a lot by maker and also by year. So not only are the F-holes important in terms of allowing the vibrating air to escape and become audible, they also allow the top of the violin to act like an entire speaker system instead of just a single speaker, which is nice. Fantastic. I love it. It's a genius. It should be noted, actually, that the uh, little tweeter wings on the F-holes um, will also vibrate for harmonics above the fundamental frequency of the note you're playing. So if you're playing, say, just an open D string, these will vibrate an octave above that, and then an octave above that octave above it, so two octaves above. So this is very good for adding sort of color and and texture and complexity and nuance to your tone. But that's sort of secondary to the function of just making sounds. <laughs> Are there different lengths of fingerboards? Does this affect the sound? Yes. Next question. No. Uh, the modern fingerboard, which is what you'll find on almost every violin, is about 70 millimeters long, anywhere between 65 and 73, depending on maker, style, and uh, just approach, really, uh, is, is acceptable. They're typically made of either solid ebony or, or an ebonized hardwood on cheaper instruments. And it just allows you to play further up on every string. Uh, this is a relatively modern invention, about 1790 to about 1805, when they started rolling out and replacing all the old uh, Baroque fingerboards, which were about 50 millimeters long, so they ended right about here. And that was basically because uh, styles of composition changed. Uh, composers like Bach, in particular, were very, very good at sort of treating the instrument, or the violin, like a starring instrument instead of like a, a backing instrument. So that it's required a longer fingerboard, so you play higher positions, and therefore cover a, a greater range on the instrument. Baroque fingerboards typically are not solid ebony. They're usually either spruce or maple with a little piece of ebony inlaid just underneath the strings. 
uh, basically just to withstand the uh, pressures of being dug into by fingers of players constantly. It was a very thin piece of ebony, so it was a very lightweight fingerboard, but honestly, as long as you reasonably thin your fingerboards, it's not going to impact the sound. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Baroque-style instruments. There's uh, an argument to be made that they are more Baroque-sounding. They're typically strung with um, gut strings without any windings on them. They've usually got an actual gut, tail gut. This one's titanium. And people are like, well, it sounds more traditional. It sounds more Baroque. First of all, there are no recordings from the Baroque period, so you don't know that. Second of all, it's just imparting physical limitations on you as a player that allows you to play in a style different than you might otherwise. Which means you're certainly getting a different character than you would on a modern style instrument, just because there are physical limitations put in place to prevent you from attaining the same character. You know, if it's something that you want as a player, or something you're pursuing as a player, I'm not going to shame you or, or, you know, look down on you for that. But it's not something that I view as strictly necessary if you're capable of adapting your playing style and your approach. Um, Gut strings certainly part of warmer tone, but they're also just a nightmare in southern Ontario. They'll last you probably three or four performances and maybe eight practices total before they either wear out just from the changes in humidity we suffer and soaking up your finger sweat, or else dry out and crack on you midway through a show. Um, so I like gut strings if you're doing a recording or you're doing like a one-off performance. I don't like them as sort of 24-7, 365 days a year go-to in our climate, which is a nightmare for instruments in general. I'll touch on that too. Actually, going back to fingerboards not really impacting the sound, there are a couple caveats. If your neck or fingerboard is super heavy, it'll impact your ability to play and therefore make good sounds. A very heavy neck and very heavy fingerboard is going to want to neck dive on you while you're playing. So you're going to have to combat that by supporting it with your hand, which is going to contribute to hand and finger fatigue, which is going to mean over the course of a show or even over the course of a song, your ability to finger and your ability to play with character is going to diminish just because your hand and wrist are exhausted. Similarly, I would say 99.5% of the actual vibration of the instrument happens between the strings and the back, so the body overall is important. The neck isn't as important. Um, as long as it's reasonably lightweight and your fingerboard is reasonably lightweight and tapered towards the end. I've seen a lot of people just slap a fingerboard blank on, which creates a little pocket of immovable air underneath it, which will dampen vibrations a little bit. But as long as you have a, a fingerboard that's been fitted well, isn't egregiously thick or egregiously heavy, it's not going to matter. So a decent quality fingerboard is a lot more important than the actual length or style of fingerboard, as far as I'm concerned and as far as most players are concerned. Are some woods better for different climates than others? Should the homeland of the buyer come into play when selecting an appropriate violin for them? Yes and no. Uh, typically violins have a spruce top, maple, everything else, and then an ebony fingerboard. There are a few exceptions. I've seen a few cherry-backed violins, but in terms of density, cherry and a soft maple will be pretty similar. So you won't likely hear too much of a difference, although you'll see it. Um, similarly, when it comes to the tailpiece material, I like to match it to the pegs, just aesthetically, but as long as your tailpiece is an appropriate weight and appropriately positioned on the violin, it's not going to impact the tone too, too much, uh, you know, provided it's strong enough to withstand the pull of the strings. I usually aim for 10 to 12 grams for a finished tailpiece with a fine tuner. Uh, I just found that's a pretty good balance in terms of not being so heavy that it dampens the vibrations of the strings and therefore the vibration at the top, but also not so light that it introduces unpleasant wolf tones, which are... Um, unpleasant overtones, which are usually an octave or two above the fundamental frequency you're playing, which come across as sort of a screeching, grating, or howling sound, which is why they're called wolf notes, incidentally. Um, so the material of the tailpiece isn't terribly important, and as long as you've got a half-decent varnish on your violin, the actual wood selection isn't going to impact um, its ability to withstand humidity changes tremendously. Uh, in the case of beginner instruments that have the cheap spray-on polyurethane finish, you'll run into issues because humidity is still going to get in through the F-holes, and then you'll end up with the inside of the violin wanting to expand and contract, but the finish is too hard, so it can't. It's going to with cracking and grazing of either the wood or the varnish, and I don't like it at all, but if it's all you can afford, it'll do you for a few years. Uh, any half-decent spirit varnish, and just about any oil varnish, will be able to allow enough moisture through it that the inside and outside of each plate of the violin will be able to expand and contract at sort of a fairly consistent rate with each other so you won't have issues with that. Where wood selection is very important is the pegs. 
There are three woods that are typically used for pegs. Uh, there are a few outliers like Pernambuco or Rosewood, which I'll touch on briefly, but I'll focus on the big three. These are ebony. Ebony is a very, very dense wood that is very resin rich. And because of that, it's very resistant to absorbing moisture from changes in ambient humidity, which means your peg fitment is going to be fairly consistent throughout the year, whether it's winter or summer, it doesn't matter, it doesn't care. However, because it's so much harder than maple, it'll wear out your peg holes and your peg box a little faster, which will just require bushing of the peg holes, but your pegs won't wear as fast. So it, it's a give and take. You know, um, rebushing a peg box is a little more expensive than having new pegs fitted, but it's not necessarily devastatingly so, especially in southern Ontario, where your other option is having your pegs reshaved twice a year when it's stupidly dry in the winter and terrifyingly humid in the summer. Um, so I usually recommend ebony if you're in southern Ontario or local to me. The other two woods that you'll typically encounter are European boxwood, which is this, which I'm also a big fan of, and Chinese boxwood, or juju, which is this. I'll touch on the actual boxwood first. Boxwood is softer than ebony and softer than maple, um, which means, unfortunately, it's very prone to expanding and contracting with changes in humidity, However, it's not going to strip out your peg box as quickly. The pegs will wear faster than the holes in the peg box will. So you'll need new pegs fitted maybe every 5, 8, or 10 years, depending on how much you play and how much you tune while playing. But these are really good for, you know, any climate with a fairly consistent humidity or any instrument of significant financial value. You want to maintain as much of the original wood as possible. And because these won't wear out the peg box, you're not going to need to install bushing, which requires drilling out the peg box, inserting a new dowel, redrilling that, refitting pegs, doing that sort of thing. And because of that, these are very good for high value instruments or anyone in a fairly temperate or consistent climate. Conversely, um, actually rosewood is a uh, similar density to boxwood, but it's a much oilier wood, so it's somewhere between boxwood and ebony in terms of uh, overall function, in terms of combating uh, changes in humidity while still not stripping out your peg box too quickly. And then you've got Chinese boxwood or jujube wood. This is actually a member of the date family. It's not related to boxwood at all. These are super lightweight. They absorb moisture. I hate them. They're terrible. Please don't use them for the love of God. I'm begging you. Sorry. Yeah, the uh, material of your pegs is sort of the most important aspect in terms of um, what climate you're in and what sort of measures you want to take in order to maintain your instrument. So that's, you know, the most important aspect to consider, though certainly not the only one. It's very top of the list by far. So I'm treating this like a guitar-specific question, although really it's sort of general and open-ended. But how does the shape of wood, size, type, etc. Affect, affect the sound produced? So in the case of acoustic guitars in particular, um, actually in the case of all instruments, the important thing is that the instrument itself is vibrating air, which hits your eardrums and vibrates that, which is what you hear. In the case of acoustic guitars, the size of the body is going to impact the amount of air moved and therefore the overall volume, uh, which also is going to affect sort of the complexity and nuance of tone. Uh, jumbo acoustic guitars are very warm and very mellow because they're moving more air, which then allows uh, more of the bottom end to carry through the um, higher tension top strings. So it's going to sound warmer, it's a little more mellow, and significantly louder. Uh, Small-bodied guitars are never going to be quite as loud as like a jumbo acoustic guitar would be, unless you make the body very, very thick so that it contains and moves the same amount of air. Similarly, with acoustic guitars, you've got bracing on the top, which affects um, how it vibrates in almost the same way that the sound post does with the violin, but not quite, but similarly enough that it it's sort of uh, serves its purpose to prove a point. Um, the wood used for guitar tops is very important, and the wood used for guitar backs and sides is also important, but in a different way than violins. So with violins, you've got the sympathetic vibration of the top and back plate, thanks to the uh, sound post. With the guitars, the ribs and the back of the body are basically acting as mirrors to reflect back the vibration of the top plate, rather than necessarily vibrating in sympathy with it. Um, so, you know, denser backs and sides will carry more of the top end through because they're not vibrating with nearly as much amplitude, uh, whereas uh, less dense backs and sides, so things like mahogany versus, say, maple, which would be more dense, um, are going to be a little warmer, a little more mellow. Um, yeah, and then 
when it comes to the actual shape. So you've got some narrow waisted acoustic guitars, you've got some broad waisted acoustic guitars, you've got some of the cutaway. The cutaway doesn't matter too, too much in terms of production of sound, but a little bit. The upper bouts of guitar body don't actually vibrate all that much. Um, yeah, but the actual shape is going to somewhat affect the sound. A very pinched waist is going to produce sort of a very strong uh, mid-range of sound, whereas a very broad waist, if you had theoretically a perfectly square guitar, you would get a very nearly perfectly balanced tone between your top and bottom end, whereas a pinched waist is going to amplify the mids and roll back the top and bass ends a little bit. But yeah, um, your top woods are essentially spruce, sometimes koa, and cedar for tops. Cedar's the warmest sounding. Spruce is the brightest sounding, but also um, the loudest. And then koa is sort of somewhere between the two in terms of both brightness and volume. That's fun.